this weekend, YouTube's going to be ablaze with a ton of reactions and endings explained for the new M. Night Shyamalan movie, Knock at the Cabin. And while they're off doing that, we're the only ones that are going to have the guts to really take a look at the actual important movie to come out this weekend. That's right, 80 for Brady. 80 for Brady is about four friends who have bonded over the New England Patriots, specifically their quarterback, Tom Brady. They have this deep connection to the team because back about 16 years ago, well, the movie takes place uh, about, <laughs> there's a lot of time jumping going on in this movie. There are three different time periods the movie takes place in. None of them are current day. Uh, so let's say the movie Prime, like primarily takes place in the year 2017. Uh, but 16 years before that, in 2001, the girls started to uh, follow football because uh, Lily Tomlin's character, uh, Lou, was recovering from cancer. And as she was recovering from cancer, finishing up her last cancer treatment, she uh, found her TV being stuck on one channel and they couldn't turn it off. And they're like, oh, we got to turn off this channel. But then who's this? What? A brand new quarterback, a rookie. They're bringing in the second string. Tom Brady. Oh, my gosh. He's so handsome. I think I could watch this. And so they do watch it and they love it. They're like, well, this is this is awesome. Football is great. Tom Brady is great. You know, they were all friends before, but they, they grow closer uh, even in this and they they're watching every game. And so the, the movie starts, though, um, with them watching the Patriots make it to the Super Bowl. And it's like, wow, that's so cool. We got to plan out the Super Bowl party now. But Lou has other plans. She brings up something that obviously they've talked about before. She's like, no, no, no. No Super Bowl party. We're not doing that this year. We're going to go. We're going to the Super Bowl. And they're like, we've looked into it. It'd be way too expensive. Also, it's only two weeks until the Super Bowl. So, like, how in the world are we going to get tickets? Ah, but then... That their favorite commentators come on and they're like, hey, yo, it's us. We're the radio DJs. And guess what? Uh, you can win tickets by telling us why you should get the tickets to go to the Super Bowl. And four of you uh, will will give away four tickets. And they're like, it's perfect. And so then they go on their first little adventure. This is really the first kind of you know quest. Like if this was a video game, this is the first like main part of the story that they're, they're trying to do. They got to get these tickets. And so they're all going about it in different ways. They're, they're calling... And they're leaving their their story talking about how, like, oh, we're friends and we're these older ladies. And that's what makes us special and why you should give us these tickets. And, you know, uh, you know, Mora is she's the, she's the wild card. Right. She's she's the fun one in the group. You know, Lou, Lou is the leader. Trish is the ladies man. And Sally Field as Betty, my favorite character, because, yes, I have a favorite character in 80 for Brady. Uh, she is all about, uh, you know, statistics and the rules and all that. She's the boring one, really, which is why I identify with her. So, but anyway, uh, Mora is using all of the other old people that live at the retirement home with her to call into the radio station and be like, hey, you know, this is my sad story. And this is why you, because they're really trying to, to play that numbers game and get these tickets. And eventually, you know, we cut to Lou and this is where we find out about her backstory and everybody and how she had the cancer. And, and you can kind of tell that she's feeling weighed down about something. And it's right here that I really made the call. I was like, oh, because, because walking in the movie, you're like, somebody's going to be dying, right? Somebody's got to be sick. Uh, they're all older people and it's, it just feels like the kind of movie where somebody's going to be dying of something. And it turns out I was right, but then she just did some tests and she got this letter from the hospital and she's afraid to open it because of what it could say. Maybe, maybe she's got the cancer again. And, you know, so she really wants to do this big fun adventure. And, and so she's sitting there trying to come up with how she's going to tell the radio station, her story. And, uh, she just can't come up with it. But then she has her first hallucination, really, of a Tom Brady where a bobblehead talks to her and tells her, man, just go for it. And so we're left to think that she submits this, uh, her story to the radio station. Next thing we see, uh, she does a reveal to her friends. Boom. Oh, we got the tickets. And they're all stoked. You yeah, are going to go. And we meet Sally Field's husband. Uh, he... Here's this is the darkest part of the movie for me. Either Sally Field's husband is so reliant on her that he needs her to to tell him to put pants on in the morning, like literally that's something she has to do, or he's really starting to show signs of dementia. And the movie doesn't really hit on it, but it as having seen that happen in people before, it really kind of felt like that's what it was doing, but it never touches on it. So I don't know. It, I'm glad it didn't because it would have colored some of uh, you know Betty's decisions in a different way that I'm glad didn't go down 
it was it kept the movie light. But it definitely kind of felt like it. Like maybe at one point in the script it was in there and they cut it. But it, it his performance, uh, her husband's performance is a little like, I mean, it's good, but it makes me a little uneasy. Anyway, all that to say, uh, they are going to be heading to Houston. They're going to the Super Bowl, right? And we get uh, some you know, backstory with, with Mora and she's like, her husband has passed away and she's sad about that. But there's this new guy at the retirement home that he kind of likes her and he's like helping her out with her scheme and everything. Um, and he, uh, the other girls come to the, the retirement home to, to bust her out because it turns out that she had taken some sleeping pills and uh, they won't let him wake her, wake her up because sleep is important. And, you know, how are they going to bust her out? You know, I'll tell you how Jane Fonda is going to flirt with the receptionist. Um, and uh, I think that this movie does a cool thing in that it really doesn't shy away from the fact that these ladies are old. Right. The movie's called 80 for Brady. It isn't trying to hide any of that and it doesn't also try to hide the fact that you know jane fonda has had a bunch of plastic surgery they mention that in the movie they don't hide the fact that she's wearing a wig you get to see her without the wig which i am like man like this movie's doing things that i didn't think it was going to do just like as a silly comedy so anyway all that to say they sneak amora out of the retirement home and they get her on the airplane and they all fly to houston and they get there and they're trying to figure out who's going to hold the tickets they give the tickets to sally field obviously she's the most responsible one and this is where the movie has its favorite joke. Well, I have a 20 in my strap-on. That's a fanny pack. If you wear it like this, it's a strap-on. Wow. And, and if you thought that joke was funny, great, because they're going to use it like 20, 20 times. So anyway, they, they go to the NFL Experience. And at the NFL Experience, uh, it's a place where it's just kind of like, you know, a bunch of booths and games and everything for them to do. And they all kind of split up and start doing their own thing. So Lou and Mora, they go over and they're starting to run like this side hustle where Tom Brady again speaks to Lou and a hallucination is all like, yo, you're going to beat this uh, this Falcon guy. Um, and in this uh, ball tossing contest, you can do it, Lou. And so they start running bets and making money off this. And they're like, yeah, we're the best. Uh, and then you also cut to Trish and Trish has written this uh, erotica, right? This fan fiction uh, starring Rob, Rob Gronkowski. And uh, it's being sold at the NFL experience, even though she didn't know that it was. Uh, but anyway, so she gets recognized and she's becomes a bit of a celebrity and she meets this guy named Dan, who's a fan of her work and uh, he won two Super Bowls himself, and they kind of are really starting to hit it off, and that's nice. But Sally Field, again, a woman after my own heart, is hungry, and she's trying to find some barbecue, right? Because they're down in Texas. That's what you got to do. And so uh, she's going around, and she finally finds that they're they got wings. They're doing a wing eating contest, and it's uh, a hot wing contest, and it's put on by none other than the mayor of Flavortown himself, Guy Fieri. And so she's up there and she's competing and everybody's watching her and they're like, she's doing great. She's winning. And she, you know, it's getting too hot. So she does take her, her fanny pack off and she puts it on the ground. And as soon as she does it, you're like, uh Oh, that was a bad move. Uh, because after finishing, uh, the, uh, the contest, she leaves them on the stage, but we don't get the reveal right away, which I, again, appreciate the movie thinking that we're smart enough. So they are recouping after eating all these spicy wings and they're hanging out with Guy Fieri. And then Trish comes back. She's like, we just got invited to this party, but I don't know if we should go to this party. It's going to be all young people and everything. And Guy Fieri's like, yo, if it's Dan's party, you got to go to that party. I mean, it's going to be so cool. I'm going to be at that party, which is obviously, you know, how we should determine whether or not a party is, is cool or not if Guy Fieri is going to be there. And so they decide, yeah, let's go to the party. And they all show up to this party in these pants suits that they packed in their trip to the Super Bowl for some reason. And they go in, in and they accidentally do some drugs and they accidentally get all split up. And again, kind of go off and do their own little side adventures, right? Trish's side adventure is a bit boring. She starts making out with Dan in a closet. More power to you, Trish. Lou and Betty realize that the tickets are missing, and so they're going looking for Guy Fieri to be like, maybe he got them because they were on the stage at his thing, and he'll be able to get them back to us. Uh, and then uh, Mora, who is really tripping, she is looking around for Guy Fieri too, but she's like hallucinating him uh, all over the place and ends up competing in this high-stakes poker game. So everybody goes upstairs to get uh, Mora, and she's been playing this poker game, and you know, it's been high stakes with some really, really big celebrities like... Patton Oswald is there and uh, the, that one lady from Parks and Recreation and somebody named Goo Goo 
they're, they're telling more, man, we lost the tickets. We're going to have to go to the NFL experience tomorrow morning and see if we can you know, get them there. And she's like, I'm going to be able to buy you tickets because I'm about to take everybody's money. And guess what? Because it's a, a movie and poker games always have to have crazy high hands in movies. She wins with like four queens, obviously four queens in this movie. So, I mean, we should have seen it coming, people. Come on. And she she wins, and she's like, yeah, we got all this money. I'm going to cash out. And the dealer's like, okay, well, what charity were you playing for? Wah, wah, wah. Oh, silly Mara. This was a charity poker game. So she donates to Goo Goo's charity, and Goo Goo's like, oh, thank you so much. Uh, you, you ladies are the best. And they're like, okay, we'll see you later. And so they go to bed. They wake up. They're like, oh, we're so hungover. And you're like, wait, I thought they did, like, weed. Like, why are they hungover? And they're like, sham pain will really make you be hung over and you're like oh okay i don't remember seeing you drink any champagne but okay works for me uh so they get all together they're ready to go to the game they go to the nfl experience and it's all closed down there's no way for them to get their tickets there so they figure hey we're here let's go to the game and we're gonna like go to the tailgate section we're gonna figure this out we get to the tailgate stuff that's going on outside of the game and this is where we get another one of our classic everybody split up and do something goofy times lou goes to the front office to say you know see if there's a lost and found that they might be able to check uh, betty goes looking for guy fietti and uh, goes knocking on a bunch of porta potties uh, and eventually finds him and does get the tickets um, but while she's doing that more is going and finding some uh, you know uh, scalpers and uh, trying to buy tickets off of them now trish she goes out and she finds the uh guys from the radio station or the or the you know, the online broadcast and 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 they tell her like well you guys didn't actually win that contest uh, it was this su tom brady support group which is a group of guys named tom brady uh, who feel like they're never gonna amount to anything because they're named tom brady and they're not as cool and awesome as tom brady and they confront lou about this and she's like oh, i you know i sold my car and I, I maxed out all my credit cards so that I could get these tickets for us. And they're like, Lou, why would you do that? And she's like, because I'm afraid I might be dying of cancer. And it's like, oh my gosh. And they're like, why didn't you tell us this, Lou? And when I'm like, that's a good question, Lou. You've been mopey and you could have just told them everyone would have understood what was going on. Yeah. And then they're just all like, you know what, Lou, it's okay. Like we're here for you. You beat it before. But like here, we're here now and you wanted to make a memorable weekend and this is it. And Sally feels like this is the best weekend of my whole life and I'm so happy. And they're like, oh, great. And so then they try to get into the game and it turns out that the tickets are fake. And so they um, got scammed, which is also like I didn't see that coming, that they were going to get scammed out of the tick of the tickets. They're, they were fake the whole time. They were running around with these tickets they thought were so valuable, but actually weren't worth anything. Um, and so now they're really kind of stuck. What are we going to do? They're standing outside the game. But ah, who do they see walking into the game? Hey, look, it's Goo Goo. Somebody that uh, Mora just did a super, super solid for. And he's all like, man, you guys can come in with me. I choreographed the halftime show. And they're like, what you did? And he's like, yeah, Lady Gaga is the one who's performing. And they're like, Goo Goo, Gaga, you get it? She don't go anywhere without me. And they're like, ha, 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 ha. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And so then they're going in another dance number. A security guard is like almost moved to tears by the dance and is like, yeah, you guys can go in. They go in, they get to the game. Uh, the other security guard who originally found their fake tickets and knows that they aren't supposed to be in there, sees them on the Jumbotron, uh, goes in and gets them and is escorting them out of the uh, the stadium. And they're like, oh, we're so defeated. We were here, but now we're getting kicked out. But, you know, who should show up? None other than our knight in shining armor. Dan himself, who has been getting ghosted by Trish because she's really afraid of, you know, over committing early and then having things not work out. Uh, so uh, Dan comes in, saves them. He's like, hey, you know what? They can come and they're with me. And they go up to the skybox and they're the executive suite. Andy Richter has a cameo, which I am all about that. Uh, and they find out across the way is where they are doing all the calls, right? It's the coaching box. And as soon as they show the coaching box, I lean over to my buddy and I'm like, hey, you know what's going to happen, right? They're going to make a call. They're going to make a call in this game. And he's like, no, 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 no way. They're not going to do that. It's like, Yeah. Yeah, they are. Now, if we actually look at what's happening in the game, uh, the Patriots are just getting stomped right now. It's like three to 28 is like would be the biggest comeback in Super Bowl history if they if they were managed to, to come back and win. And there's like there's no way it's going to happen. And so 
the ladies sneak over to the, the coaching box and they break into it and they're arguing with the coaches and, and the players accidentally hear uh, Betty, uh, you know, our girl, the best one, Betty, the Donatello of the group. She gives them a play to run. They run that play instead of the play that the coaches wanted to run. Oh, they stop the guy and, you know, it's our ball now. And they're like, we, yeah, we did it. And uh, they're like, oh, we got to get these guys out of here. But before they can get them out of there, Lou grabs the headset and she starts talking. She's like, Tom, Tom, are you there, Tom? And Tom Brady stands up. He looks up at the box. He's got his helmet up by his ear so he can hear. You can't give up, Tom. Because I didn't give up. When, when I had my cancer, because of you, Tom, and you inspire us, Tom. You're the best that there ever was. And everybody loves you and the people who don't love you, because that's definitely not true. Not everybody loves Tom Brady. But the people who don't love you, they respect you. And she's like, you can't, you can't give up. And then Tom Brady is all like, gets up and drops the F-bomb in the movie. And I was like, I'm taken aback by that. Uh, and that, that part really happens. So you might want to prepare your granny for that one if you're taking her to see it. So anyway, after Lou has her, you know, Rocky Balboa speech, the game starts to pick up. Hey, look, they're going. And of course, like, you know, they're going to win. Well, even if you, because like, it's a real game that actually happens. So if you know anything about football, you're aware of who, who won that Super Bowl. But then even if you don't know anything about football, you're like, why would they pick a Super Bowl where the the Patriots didn't win to put in the movie? So it's kind of like it's the least important part of the movie. <laughs> What's it going on in the football game? Uh, but, you know, it all happens. Game uh, finishes up. Uh, it turns out that Amora had placed a bet with the box owner uh, be, uh, to, because the odds were so crazy that the Patriots would be able to come back. And she wins a ton of money and is able to pay back a Lou for all the, the that she lost to be able to get them there. And everything is perfect. What a wonderful ending. There's nothing bad that could happen now. Uh-oh. It's the security guard again. And he's taking them out. He's like, no, no, no. You got to go through this door. And he leads them right into the locker room where they all get to have some nice interactions with some players, you know, you know. Trish gets to uh, interact with Rob and find out that he reads the book about uh, him making love to people, uh, which would be a weird thing, I would imagine, for everyone involved. Betty gets to talk to like the statistically best uh, player, and he's all like, nobody ever says that I'm good, but, but Betty does, because Betty's the best. Uh, Mora is all up in some guy's beard, and then, of course, Lou gets a chance to talk with Tom Brady. And it's wonderful, and everybody's happy, and Tom Brady's like, you know, you say I inspire you, but you inspire me. And he does a fine job. It's whatever. It's definitely not the worst athlete as an actor performance we've ever seen. So so then we cut to three years later, the year is 2020, and the Buccaneers are in the Super Bowl, and we're at Lou's house but we don't see Lou anywhere on her chair is a blanket draped over. That's very solemn looking, but everyone else is getting ready for the game to start. Uh, her daughter's there who we've seen a couple times. Um, and it, they're just, you know, okay, games get ready to start. But then they're like, but where's mom? And you're like, Oh, thank goodness. She's not actually dead. The movie tried to make us think she died <laughs> for a second there. Um, and, but it turns out she didn't. Everybody's still alive. And, you know, we get to finish with, like, one more. Tom, Tom Brady. And that's 80 for Brady. And, uh, I, again, it's not a bad movie at all. I think that you could do way worse. Uh, the ladies act the heck out of the script. Um, it's really weird that this is this director's first movie. Um, but, you know, hey, go get them, buddy. Uh, and that is the ending explained. Oh, wait. I forgot. There's a post credit scene or a mid credit scene. The ladies are on a beach and they're talking about how they've all retired from their jobs and everything. And then we pan over who's with them. Tom Brady, baby. And he's all like, you know what? I figure why retire when you still got it, which is extremely hilarious because Tom Brady <laughs> retired like last week again. So I guess he doesn't think he's got it anymore. <laughs> And that's going to finish up our video. Thank you so much for watching and stopping by. My name is Seth. Thank you so much for having been here. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.